As the DOJ sets its sights on school board meetings, parents are speaking out about the intimidation they're feeling at the prospect of being labeled a domestic terrorist for speaking out against critical race theory. One parent, a survivor of China's Cultural Revolution, is even going so far as to say the government tactics are straight out of Mao's playbook. Friends, it's time for Hold the Line. Welcome to Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. You would think that we could all agree as Americans that parents should have a say in what their kids are being taught in schools and that this is an essential part of our republic running the way that it should, that we should have parents involved. If we're gonna have a public school system, they should certainly get a say and that this is all entirely in keeping with what we should expect. But no, what we've seen instead is that as parents push back on the teaching of critical race theory, the transgender agenda being instituted in schools, and even mask mandates becoming flashpoints for real disagreements with parents when it comes to what their kids are being subjected to, Democrats are very angry about this and want parents to shut up. Watch. Violent looking, angry, spewing parents outside of these schools. Individuals intent on creating chaos for the sake of creating chaos. These actions could be the equivalent to a form of domestic terrorism. This becomes a security crisis in a sense for the nation. This may also mobilize even more law enforcement to, to be at these meetings. It is dangerous to our children when the parents themselves are the school bullies. I think one of the worst things is the actions at the board meetings, uh, you know, the, the, the calling of names, you know, the, you know, tyrant, Marxist, communist. We've never seen anything like we're seeing at these school boards now. What on earth has happened in this country? Sometimes they're not even talking. They are yelling and creating chaos. Things have become so scary at these meetings. New laws may be necessary. There's always the possibility uh, that people will face criminal prosecution for this kind of conduct. Criminal prosecution, domestic terrorists. These are parents who are saying they don't want their kids being taught divisive, racist nonsense in school or being forced to choke through completely ineffective cloth masks all day for the benefit of teachers who are vaccinated, aren't they? And if they're not, why aren't they? Doesn't the left demand that from everybody else? What the heck is going on here? Well, it seems that we have established that the school system is an institution of the progressive left in this country. They are brainwashing children. They are using this for their own power. They're propping up politicians, particularly the teachers' unions. And there is an unholy alliance of the left that's underway here. And some people see this and recognize it as a problem, not just in the American context, but as having echoes of some of the other authoritarian or totalitarian regimes of the past. Here's a mom in Loudoun County, which is the premier flashpoint these days for these school board meetings. Uh, she, Van Fleet, and she was saying that what the DOJ recently said about parents speaking out against some of the things they object to in schools, the way the Department of Justice came down on them reminds her of the Cultural Revolution in Mao's China. When I was in China, I spent my entire school years in the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So I'm very, very familiar with the communist tactics of how they divide people, how they cancel the Chinese traditional culture and destroy our heritage. And all this is happening here in America. Now they are labeling parents and concerned citizen like me as domestic terrorists, what that can do? You may lose your freedom. I do have a question. What's the next step? Is the Tiananmen Square crackdown the next? Would the parents one day risk their life just to speak out for the children? You're asking critical questions are that first aired on Fox News' digital operation. Uh, she's talking about how if this continues on, where does it stop? Where do the uh, government agents who are willing to say right now that you're a domestic terrorist for, for speaking out, uh, where will they draw the line? Will they use force? Will they arrest people? Will they bludgeon them in public? She mentioned Tiananmen Square. We all know what happened there in China. People trying to take action against a totalitarian regime. There are certainly some echoes of that in what we are seeing today from the Department of Justice. and the left in general when it comes to parents speaking out in schools. Again, 
From Fox News, here's Shee Van Fleet, this mother in Loudoun County, saying that the intimidation tactics that are being used by the DOJ about these school board meetings remind her of what happened with Mao. I think it's intimidation, no doubt about it. You know, so they call them racists for a long time, but that did not work. So they have to upgrade to domestic terrorists. But I have to say, this will backfire. If the intimidation works, American has fallen a long time ago. Uh, it will backfire. It remains to be seen. I hope she's right. Here's what's going on. The left has used public education in this country as a means of creating future leftist Democrat voters and replicating its own ideology for a very long time. And now finally, because of the lockdowns, because of what we've been through during COVID, what we have seen is that there is, in fact, a real problem of critical race theory. Parents who stayed home with their kids saw this being taught to them. They also were much more able to watch over what kind of indoctrination was going on in the public school system. And again, to this Fox News piece with She Van Fleet, this mother in Loudoun County, she's saying the public schools are government schools, really, trying to do the government's bidding, just like they were in Mao's revolution, cultural revolutionary era, China. In China, the school, the public school, are really government school. And here, it's the same thing is happening here. The radical left, has already taken over our educational system. They control the schools, the school board, and other associations, such as teacher association and the national uh, school board association. And they actually have been training our children to be the social justice warriors for a long time. She's absolutely right. That is what is happening. The public school system is training children to become social justice warriors and therefore become ideologues for the benefit of the political and progressive left in this country. That's what's actually going on. Now, if this was a good thing, you would think Democrats would just speak openly and honestly about it and say, that's right, that's what we're doing, we believe in this, but they have to hide it from concerned parents. There's in fact a very important uh, gubernatorial race in just a matter of weeks between Glenn Youngkin and Terry McAuliffe, a longtime DNC and Clinton hack, and Terry McAuliffe, who's a point or two ahead right now in some of the polls, a very close race for the governor's house in Virginia, is trying to pull the, oh, they don't teach CRT in Virginia public schools, and it's a racist dog whistle, he says. Are taught. I was very clear that we don't teach critical race theory here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and it's a racist dog whistle, and he's got to stop it. I'm about uniting. Our children should not be used as political pawns. Oh no, the left uses, the Democrats use children as political pawns all the time. They don't get to play this, we don't use kids as pawns move now. Sorry, too late for that. Parents have woken up. All right, a startling story out of Loudoun County. We're just talking about Loudoun County, Virginia. As a father claims his local school board attempted to cover up the rape of his daughter by a fellow student who claims to be gender fluid. We'll talk to the Daily Wire's Luke Rosiak, who broke the story when we come back. But I want to tell you about my friends at My Digital Money. Crypto market is heating up. A lot of people want to get in on the action for the first time, but there's a lot of digital currencies out there. Bitcoin, Ethereum, lots of tokens. Where do you get started? That's why you need My Digital Money. My Digital Money is an easy-to-use self-trading crypto IRA platform. It's one of the few U.S.-based cryptocurrency companies that will answer your phone call and help you get started. It offers you incredible, unparalleled military-grade security for your coins. I'm telling you, this is the platform you should be using. Listen, the crypto market's heating up again. This could be a really good time to get started in this exciting technology-based investment. You need to go with My Digital Money. Go to MyDigitalMoney.com. Again, that's MyDigitalMoney.com. And we'll be right back with more Hold the Line. We've played you that video multiple times now, showing a father at a Loudoun County School Board meeting being tackled and arrested by police back in June. Well, it turns out that father, Scott Smith, had every right to show up at that meeting and cause a scene. Smith alleges that weeks before he was arrested, his daughter was sexually assaulted by a gender-fluid individual in a school bathroom. Even more infuriating, the district tried to cover up the assault to further its transgender rights agenda. 
And now Scott Smith's understandable outrage has turned him into the left's poster child for a right-wing domestic terror situation. Joining me now is the investigative reporter who broke this story, The Daily Wire's Luke Rosiak. Luke, appreciate you being with us. Thanks for having me. Just for anybody who hasn't had a chance to read your article, which goes into some depth and detail about this, and again, uh, some really strong work from you pulling all these facts together, what do people need to know about what happened leading up to the actual school board meeting that we just showed the video of? On May 28th, Scott Smith's daughter was allegedly uh, sexually assaulted in a bathroom at school by a boy wearing a skirt. Um, that person was charged with forcible sodomy. Now, in on uh, that meeting was in June, on June 22nd, and the focus of the discussion was a transgender policy that would involve bathrooms, and a lot of people were opposed to the policy. Um, the school, the superintendent told the public that they were afraid of quote a red herring because Time Magazine told him there was no such thing as a quote transgender predator. Additionally, he said Loudoun County's own records showed that the school system had never had any bathroom assault. And so Scott Smith is sitting there in the audience thinking, just three weeks ago, the police were called to my school. My daughter was taken to the hospital and a rape kit was administered. And you're all up here lying. It's like, I thought you believed all women. And so he's getting very angry in the crowd. And eventually he says, a leftist activist um, said, why are you here? And implying that he's a bigot. And he said, he tried to explain to her what happened to his daughter. And he says that leftist activist, a neighbor of his said, I don't believe you. And that's when you know he got so mad that the cops put his hands on him pretty soon. They were tussling. He was ultimately charged with uh, disorderly conduct. So, yeah, I mean, he's played all over the news since as kind of unruly, blue collar, uh, you know, white man showing up at school board meetings to cause a scene. I think a lot of dads would say uh, he was a lot more restrained than many of us would have been in that situation. How did the Loudoun County school officials at the school where this assault of a ninth grade girl took place? Uh, allegedly by this gender fluid individual wearing a skirt who was also a student. Uh, how did the school react to that? And also what did they do when the father initially tried to bring to their attention that this assault had occurred? So he and his wife got a call from the school saying that his daughter had been physically assaulted in the bathroom by a boy. And when he got to school, he determined it was much worse than that. The daughter wasn't beat up. It was something much worse. And so he became, he demanded that they take it seriously. And he said they weren't. And he got so mad, he caused a scene in the front office. And they called the police on him. Um, now, Loudoun County put out a statement today uh, trying to get out ahead of all the, the anger that they've received for this story, saying, you know, we did call the police that day. And they, they made it seem like they called the police for the sexual assault. But if you read the statement carefully, um, you know, it seems like this could really fit them calling it on him. And in fact, I have an email from the principal that's in my original story in the Daily Wire, where the principal sent an email to this entire student body that day saying, you may have seen students on uh, police on campus. I want you to know the reason they were here was because of an incident that was confined to the main office and no students, uh, the safety of the student body was not jeopardized. So now the Loudoun County uh, schools are trying to say that they called the cops, but at the time they explicitly said the reason the police were there was to because of smith causing a scene it was the parent who was the problem not the rape and they didn't tell anyone in the public that this had occurred and so you know fast forward until a week ago the same kid was arrested for uh the sexual assault of, a, of another girl so now there have been two sexual assaults allegedly by the same individual gender fluid individual at this high school the first one it seems the school administration tried to cover up, is that fair? I mean, how, how have prosecutors in the county, in Loudoun County, reacted to this situation? 
So the student was being charged with forcible sodomy in the May incident. The problem is that the school system didn't tell anyone. Uh, they put out a statement based that you know implies that it, nothing ever happened that day. And then at the school board meeting three weeks later, they affirmatively told the public, um, "There's no uh, no no bathroom assaults of any kind in our whole school system." And so absolutely, they were they were denying that this ever happened. Wow, there were you know a criminal investigation going on that ultimately resulted in uh, the kid was expected to plead guilty uh, tomorrow actually uh, October 14th uh, he was you know expected to plead guilty to felony sex crimes in connection with the May incident uh, but in between there they didn't want anyone to find out they passed their, their their trans school policy they arrested the dad for showing up at the school board meeting and they banned him from the school board uh, you know where they have the school board meetings uh, which prevented him from having any chance of telling school board, telling the school board in front of the public. Actually, there's a reason why people may have concerns about this trans policy. So prosecutors were dealing with the second, with the first rape. Um, the issue is the school system's handling of it. However, there's also an issue with the prosecutors. When they arrested Scott Smith for the video you played of him kind of, you know, being disorderly, the prosecutor who's a far left, one of these Soros funded reformer types that wants to end you know, mass incarceration. She personally showed up to prosecute his case and she tried to put him in jail for disorderly conduct, which is unheard of. So while they're trying to ram this transgender policy down the, uh, onto this community where a lot of people don't want it, they're really, they're literally trying to put the father of a, an alleged rape victim in jail. We actually have some video here of Loudoun County school officials seemingly attempting to cover up the assault. Do we have assaults in our bathrooms or our locker rooms regularly? To my knowledge, we don't have any records of assaults occurring in our restrooms. The issue of assaults taking place or transgender students assaulting other students in the restroom, uh, Time Magazine in 2016 called that um, a red herring. Predator transgender student is or person simply it does not exist. Does not exist, he says, Luke. That seems like a lie for the school superintendent to, see, to say that at that hearing. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine how Scott Smith felt. And there was 250 people signed up to speak that night, most of them against the policy. Some of them were in favor of it, but a lot of those people were saying, uh, the people who are against this are filled with hate. They're bigots, they hate. And you know, there was a caricature going on. There was a demonization of half of whatever percentage of the community uh, that led to no one listening to Scott when he had something to say. And you played the video, which a lot of people haven't, where you can hear on that video, and the media has had that video for a long time. They say while he's getting arrested, his wife screams out, my daughter was raped in school and this is what happened. So Scott was trying to get people to listen to him and they had this idea of him instead that he was there because he's a bigot or as the National School Board Association later said, he's one of, uh, one of these parents that could be de potential domestic terrorists. Um, there's a real anger right now and there's anger for a good reason because the schools have been run for the benefit of uh, politicians who are trying to push a political agenda and our kids are just a way to do it. Um, they've been run for the career advancement of school administrators who are willing to do things that harm kids to protect their own career. Uh, especially when there's bad things going on. They don't want you to find out. They'll hide it. Um, you know, there's the teachers unions that shut down schools for a year to the detriment of kids. And so it's been, it's been something to watch people get involved in schools because this is an area where we can make a difference. You know, our voice as individual Americans, it may not count for much when it comes to a presidential election, but man, there's good reason to get involved in your local schools because this isn't just happening in Loudoun. Loudoun just happens to be getting a lot of uh, media coverage on it. Thank you so much, Luke, for your work on this and for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Buck. The consumer price index continues to rise and Americans are paying a lot more for basics like groceries and gas. I guess inflation isn't a temporary problem as the Biden administration has claimed. We'll have more on that with former Trump economic advisor, Stephen Moore, when we come back. If you ever thought about investing in real estate, I want you to take me up on this recommendation. Visit doneforyoubuck.com where you can learn more about my friends at Done For Your Real Estate. If you haven't checked them out, let me make this easy for you. These guys have found a way to make real estate investing straightforward and their system flat out works. I know because I'm using it. It allows everyday hardworking Americans like you and me to finally own investment real estate with all the, without all the risk and difficulty of doing it on your own. 
Look, I can't tell you in this one commercial all the things they do and how amazing they are at it. So do this for me right now. Go to doneforyoubuck.com. At the top of the page is a podcast interview I did with Done For You Real Estate. You can hear about my personal experience with their company in my own words. I'll tell you about it in detail. Picking the city, the house, getting the broker, the loan, even getting a tenant in place. Visit doneforyoubuck.com, listen to the podcast interview, and give my friends a chance to show you what they can do for you. Economist Stephen Moore joins us next. Stay with us. The American people continue to pay the price for President Biden's disastrous leadership, this time by increasing the cost of, their, of living their daily lives. According to CNBC, the consumer price index for all items rose 0.4% for the month, compared with the 0.3% Dow Jones estimated. On a year-over-year basis, prices increased 5.4% versus the estimate for 5.3% and the highest since January of 1991. Joe Biden continues to push the narrative that this is only a short-term problem. Is that true? Others see it differently, perceiving this as a hidden tax on American families. For more on this, former Trump economic advisor and senior contributor at FreedomWorks, Stephen Ward joins us now to discuss. Stephen, thank you. Good to be with you. And by the way, I don't think anybody now really believes that inflation is, quote, transitory, uh, that, that we're seeing a, an inflation problem that is getting worse with every passing month. Uh, we're looking at an energy crisis with higher oil prices. By the way, I believe that uh, that by the within another month or so, we're going to be looking at five dollar a gallon gasoline prices. That's going to filter through the economy. Higher food prices, higher rental prices, uh, higher transportation prices. So we've we've got a real, uh, real, uh, I think, a crisis on our hands. What's the primary cause of this? I mean, if we're looking at the decision-making that has been involved in the past uh, year of the Biden administration that has led us to this. What are the missteps, Stephen? What's going on? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we do have a supply chain problem where it's just getting difficult for getting goods and services, you know, off the trucks or off the ships and to the to the aisles of the grocery store or the, or the mom and pop stores across the country. Um, that's a big problem because we don't have enough workers and we don't have enough workers because Biden's policy has been to pay people not to work with massive increases in unemployment benefits and you know, things like uh, food stamps, rental assistance and those kinds of things. Then you have the problem of, of the, this energy crisis that I just mentioned. There's a worldwide shortage now of natural gas, oil, and you've got a lot of the world now turning to coal. And it's become kind of a, a, a real tragedy uh, in terms of what's going on with respect to um, the higher and higher prices of energy. Uh, the European countries are already facing seven, eight dollar gallon uh, increases in gas prices. I think it's going to happen here. So it's, a, it's just a perfect storm. And the thing that's going to make this inflation problem even worse is if we pass another four trillion dollar debt bill paid for by printing more money. That's just going to make you know the inflation rate go from five and six percent to seven, eight, nine, ten percent. We have uh, Janet Yellen of the Treasury saying the following. Wanted to have you uh, react to her latest on how things are going to get back under control. Uh, supply chains are very stressed. We get the pandemic under control. The global economy comes back. These pressures will uh, mitigate and I believe we'll go back to normal levels. Uh, so it's the pandemic. That's what they're telling us now. What do you make of it? Uh, there's some truth to that. Yeah, obviously, the pandemic and the second wave is hurt, you know, is hurt production and it's hurt the supply chain. But my God, I mean, remember, Biden said he was going to he's going to deal with the pandemic. And in some some ways, it feels like it's worse now than it's been in the past. So why hasn't the Biden administration taken steps to deal with this? And then you've got, for example, all of these cargo ships outside of the Los Angeles ports that can't get uh, their, you know, uh, their discharge, their merchandise. And and Biden just this week said, well, we're going to have to have a uh, we're going to have to have a policy to deal with that. But why is it taking them so long? I mean, this has been a problem that's been festering for months. I just think the Biden administration is behind the curve uh, on all of these problems, whether it's inflation, the border crisis, the energy crisis, the, the problem with the supply chain. It doesn't seem like anyone's in charge in the White House of dealing with these major economic problems. What would the Biden administration do if they were going to listen to a Steve Moore advice at this point in time? specifically on the inflation issue. I mean, okay, don't spend the four and a half trillion dollars. That's step one. What would step two be? 
Let's produce American energy. <laughs> we have more oil, gas, and coal than any other country in the world. There's a massive global demand for this stuff. And at the very much the time that people want to buy this stuff, Biden isn't producing it. So now he has to go over to the uh, OPEC countries like the Saudis and beg them to produce more oil. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. It defies common sense that we would have these kinds of policies in place. We ought to reduce the taxes on our businesses, not raise them, so they can increase the supply of goods and services. I just think all of the Biden administration economic policies are backwards, they're hurting the economy. I think these problems are gonna get worse before they get better. And boy, even this infrastructure bill that they're talking about, that's a massive amount of money to be spending and flushing into the economy. It's almost like helicopter money, we're just dropping out of helicopters. It, it is. It is making everything more expensive and it's making it more difficult for the uh, employers to get workers back on the job. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the job participation situation as well. We, we are told by the Biden administration that unemployment is five, what is it, 5.4 or something. That they, they put out this number that they say un that unemployment is very low. But we also have a lot, millions of unfilled jobs and a labor shortage What's actually happening in the labor market and how is it affecting the U.S. economy right now? Well, a couple of things. I mean, I mentioned the fact that the Biden administration has gotten rid of the work requirements for welfare, so we can't seem to get people off of the couch back in a job. Just ask any small business. I see you have the McDonald's sign there. Ask people who run businesses and they will tell you they're having a very, very difficult time getting these uh, people back on the job. Uh, we also shouldn't have this vaccine mandate. I think the vaccine mandate is holding a lot of people out of jobs. You saw what happened to a Southwest Airlines where a lot of the pilots didn't show up for work and therefore they couldn't run the flights. Steve, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, anytime. As unvaccinated Americans feel the pressure of vaccine mandates, some are taking a stand, including Brooklyn Nets point guard Kyrie Irving. When we come back, the first TV's Rob Smith joins us here in studio to discuss the NBA star's refusal to back down. Right now, I want to tell you one more time about my friends at My Digital Money. Everybody seems wants to get into crypto these days, Bitcoin, Ethereum, so many digital tokens out there that could have huge upside. But where do you get started if you've never done it before? That's where My Digital Money comes in. It's an easy to use self-trading crypto IRA platform. It's one of the few US-based cryptocurrency companies that'll answer your phone call and help you get started. Because your comfort and security is their absolute top priority. They offer an unparalleled military-grade security for your coins, Trigger orders to help you secure opportunities or limit losses without having to watch your account 24-7. And a play money account so you can test the market without risking your money. Look, the crypto market is heating up. This might be the best time in a long time to get in this exciting technology-based investment. You need a team of professionals who have your back when it comes to your money. That's what you have with My Digital Money. Go to MyDigitalMoney.com. Again, that's MyDigitalMoney.com. We'll be right back. Another high-profile athlete has come out against the vaccine mandate. Brooklyn Nets superstar Kyrie Irving is sidelined indefinitely, marking him as ineligible to play or practice with the team until he becomes a full participant, a.k.a. get the jab or you are suspended without pay. On one side of the aisle, Kyrie is praised for his pro-choice stance on the vaccine, but on the other, they're scolding him. No surprise there. Rob Smith is host of the podcast. Rob Smith is problematic. He joins me on a break down the hypocrisy. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you as what, well. Thank you for being here uh, with us in, in New York City. So tell me this, man. What are you seeing in terms of the Kyrie situation here? Because it feels like there's a lot of ways they can handle this other than forcing the guy to get the shot. A young, healthy guy, by the way. Well, here's the thing. This is how I feel about the vaccine. And this is how I've always felt about it. If you want it, get it. If you don't want it, you shouldn't be forced to get it. And there is just such this overwhelming pressure that we're putting on people in order to get to get this vaccine. And I think that Kyrie Irving, it's very interesting that he is taking this stance against the being mandated to take the vaccine. He is losing out on millions of dollars in the process. And there's a racial aspect of it here too that I think is very interesting because look, 
in New York City, I believe 28% of black Americans have chosen to get the vaccine. So that means with these mandates, you're locking 72% of African Americans out of, of public life, out of going to bars, restaurants, movie theaters, et cetera. And that's something that nobody talks about. So I think it's interesting that Kyrie Irving is taking this stance against the mandates. I think it's interesting that Nicki Minaj came out and said that she's against these mandates, that she decided not to attend these events because they're mandating the vaccine. I think it's very interesting. And what you will see with the media is that they will send their minions out here to bully, to shame Kyrie Irving, to try to destroy him, to try to pressure him to do this because they want to make it seem as if he's going to be the model for all of these other black Americans that they're trying to push this vaccine on. But I think good for him for standing up. He's taking an actual stand. He's losing out on millions of dollars. Here are uh, Cuomo and Lemon over at CNN, slamming him, of course. You're not going to do something that science tells you to do to keep yourself and others safe in your community? Yeah. Out of some perverse sense of freedom just because you don't have to? You do have the freedom not to, so then don't do it. But then you cannot expect to do what everyone else does. You have the freedom. And that's what they're telling him. You got the freedom. We're not going to cancel you. We're not going to fire you, but you're going to be benched. Well, he's going to lose a lot of money. Okay, fine. But that's what, those are the consequences. Uh, First of all, I love this notion that science tells him. No, science doesn't tell him anything, actually. The science would say that he's at effectively no personal risk whatsoever from COVID-19. But they also like to pretend that coercion is somehow not a contradiction of freedom. Of course. And look, Don Lemon is such a stooge, such a tool. I mean, look, with Don Lemon, I I think that what happens with Don, and it's with Don Lemon, it's with Joy Reid or whatever, those are the two black people in the mainstream media that they use to to attack other black people that are getting out of line, particularly when it comes to this vaccine stuff, right? Um, You see both Joy Reid and Don Lemon attack Nicki Minaj. Um, Don Lemon is now attacking Kyrie Irving. Do you see the pattern that's going on here? So I can't really take anything that any of these two, either of these two idiots say seriously because they are just such stooges and such tools for the mainstream propaganda push. I hate it. And we also see that there are some people that are shamed much more aggressively than others when it comes to their vaccine sense. Wasn't it... uh... The, the female hip hop artist, I'm forgetting which one it was, who was after she had tweeted out the uh, the thing about her friend who got the shot and then had the problem in his yeah. man area. She was invited to the White House, I believe, yeah. for a conversation. That was Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj. Yeah, yeah. that was Nicki Minaj. Um, and so th- she said, apparently, she said that the White House contacted her to go have a discussion. And then they were starting to say that now she was lying about it. And she had to go on her live and say that she wasn't lying about it. And what happened to her with the entirety of the mainstream media coming together to basically attack and bully her because she didn't feel the right way about the vaccine mandates. We see this with Kyrie Irving. We saw it with Nicki Minaj. We saw it um, not about the vaccine, but with Kanye West uh, when he came out in support of Donald Trump. Remember that a couple of years ago. I remember doing the rounds on cable news, sort of like defending um, Kanye from people that were talking about his mental stability on air as if they were his psychiatrist or something like that. So there's a pattern here. Rob, shifting gears here for a second. Jonathan Kent, the new iteration of Superman, is now a bisexual superhero who will tackle ideas such as the deportation of refugees, stopping a high school shooting, and putting out wildfires caused by climate change. Because, of course, uh, Superman is bisexual now. What do we think of this? Look, and this is what I say about this. I I understand. So there is an aspect of the LGBT community that thinks that they're never going to get to a certain place or they're never going to be happy or anything like that until they see themselves reflected in every aspect of society. What I don't like is sort of retconning a character that already exists and making, you know, Superman gay. So he's a new Superman now, so we're going to make the new Superman gay. Instead of making him gay, how about they create a whole new gay superhero? I am available to be the model for this. It would be very interesting if they did that, but instead, it's just more far left woke propaganda. And I didn't even know this stuff. Like, I knew that the new Superman was bisexual. I didn't know the stuff about um, helping refugees and, and fighting climate change and all this stuff. It, it's woke propaganda. I mean, I love the point. climate change fires. You think the new bisexual Superman is going to spend a lot of time focused on, uh, you know, recycling and making sure that he doesn't 
take showers that go too long. I mean, the things they tell yeah. you in California you have to do to save the environment. I don't know if that's really going to have the impact they want. There was that cartoon a long time ago, Captain Planet. Captain Did you Planet. ever see it? Captain Planet, yes. That cartoon sucked. Yeah, I was just going to bring it up. I remember Captain Planet. Look, and the th interesting thing about this to me is that they're trying to pander to an audience that isn't even their base. Uh, most gay people are, are not really into comic books. We, we don't tend to be comic book nerds. So who is it that they're appealing to? They're appealing to the woke Twitter mob who would never consume this content anyway and turning off the people that are their normal consumers. I just, I don't get it. What do you think, by the way, of the way that uh, Gruden, the NFL coach, has been booted and now even erased from like the circle uh -huh. of greatness that the Buccaneers have. I forget what it's called. There's some kind of a Hall of Fame equivalent just for the, the Tampa Bay yeah. Buccaneers. You live right down there in, in Florida. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think about this? I was thinking it's interesting how much they point out that he said mean things. Some of the things he said over the line, not, no, not, not acceptable, no yeah. question. But he also said mean things about Joe Biden. And we're supposed to care about that. So look, here's where I stand on this. Um, the things that he said were reprehensible. I thought they were gross. I mean, I, you know, I've been the target of that kind of racism before, so it's not something that I take lightly. But here's the thing, and this is the question that we have to start asking ourselves as a society. Um, are we gonna be able to rehabilitate people? Are we gonna allow people to make mistakes, own up to them and move forward? Can they apologize? I just think, and I've said this about this situation, I say this every time somebody gets canceled, the, um, the reporter at um, Axios now, she was gonna be the head of Team Vogue, Alexa McCammon, and she was canceled, this is a black woman, and she was fired and canceled or whatever because she said something mean about Asians on Twitter 10 years ago. And I said the same thing about this situation that I said about her situation, let people apologize, give them space to grow, um, let everybody move on from it. Because if we're just canceling people and erasing them from society over stuff like this, we're not providing a path to people getting better, um, realizing their mistakes, owning up to them and moving forward, um, but we're also making these people that we cast out even more angrier and even more aggrieved, and that's where you get like these multimillionaires that are acting like they're victims of, of cancel culture and stuff like that. Um, I think cancel culture is bad, but I think that we also need to forgive and give people a path to sort of being um, rehabilitated. Very well said. Rob, appreciate you coming by, shedding some light on all these topics, man. Good to see you here in NYC. Always, always, Buck. The Fouch does it again, this time saying it'll be very difficult to truly eliminate COVID for good. So does that mean he'll get to stay in power forever? We'll discuss that in quick hits, but let's take a second to look at one of the newest sponsors here and Hold the Line, Fume. Fume is the number one natural way to quit smoking and vaping. It's all about creating positive habits, and here's how simple they make it. Fume created a natural inhaler that allows your body to receive the amazing benefits from some of the world's best super plants. It's Canadian made, handcrafted. It's a wooden inhaler with no electronics and it makes quitting smoking easier. You need to check them out now. Head to breathefume, spelled F-U-M, dot com slash buck. That's breathefum dot com slash buck. And take their quiz to find out which super plants are best for you. It's quick and easy and it'll point you to the specific plants and the research behind them for their specific benefits. When you use code BUCK at checkout, you'll get 10% off. Breathe in the benefits of the world's super plants today. Don't wait, don't wait, go now. Breathefume.com slash BUCK, that's breathefum.com slash BUCK, and we will be right back with Quick Hits. Demi Lovato is now the wokest star in the galaxy. And you better make sure to wear your mask on a windy day because COVID can travel in a breeze. Terrifying, right? Time for quick hits. Let's get to it first. When does all this stop? When does it go away, all the COVID stuff? Well, you know, probably never. That's what Fauci's willing to do. Now, keep in mind here, we've been led to believe by many of the actions that the government has forced upon us because of Fauciism that we would essentially rid ourselves of COVID once and for all, if only we just listened to them. Now they're having to admit, turns out that's not really true at all. COVID's going to be around. It will never be gone entirely. Here's what the Fouch is saying as of today. We are seeing now a decline in acceleration and a turnaround of cases. Where do we ultimately want to be? As I mentioned, it is going to be very difficult, at least in the foreseeable future and maybe ever, to truly eliminate this highly transmissible virus. And again, as I mentioned, we've only eradicated one. Yeah, we'll have to see how this plays out. 
He doesn't want you to ever have your life back, no normalcy. You're supposed to just suffer through this nonsense for as long as they tell you to and then be thankful when one day it becomes impossible for them to continue the charade and they'll give you most of your freedom back, except they'll always say that they could take it away from you again whenever they want. That's the problem with setting this precedent. That's the problem with Fauciism. It has been all along. Let's have a little fun, shall we? Demi Lovato, recording artist. I could not tell you a single song of hers off the top of my head. Control Room, what, what's, a, what's a Demi Lovato song that I might know? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not cool, so I don't know these things. Uh, we, yeah, they don't know either, apparently. So, that's, that, so recording artist, you know, we got to get somebody who knows what she's recorded. Anyway. She said this. I couldn't believe this was real. Apparently it is. She said this about standing up for aliens. Quote, I really think that if there was anything out there that would want to do harm to us, it would have happened by now. But I think we have to stop calling them aliens because aliens is a derogatory term for anything. That's why I like to call them ETs or extraterrestrials. Now, E.T. is a great movie, I will say that, but I don't think the non-existent alien life forms that we refer to as aliens are offended Because one, they don't exist, and two, they probably don't speak English. That's, I'm going to say, I think that's a high probability proposition that I've just put out there for you. Joe Scarborough used to be a Republican. Do you you know that? He used to be somebody who talked about Republican values. Scarborough Country was his right-wing show, or allegedly right-wing show, that was on MSNBC. But now he just dances to the tune of whoever's writing the checks. It doesn't really matter who it is, as long as... The checks keep flowing in, and he gets to feel important while he's on TV. It's all that matters. doesn't actually really stand for anything. And so that's why he likes to say things for the entertainment of the MSNBC crowd, like calling the Capitol Hill rioters fascists. This is exactly what Republicans don't want Americans to see. If there's a conspiracy of silence uh, that they've created around January the 6th, it's all to protect Donald Trump and their brand for the heinous reaction this man had to a fascist crowd overtaking a Capitol, brutalizing police officers, committing sedition to try to stop the constitutional process of counting the electoral votes. They'll never give it up on this thing, will they? It was a riot. Some people did some dumb things. And they act like this was an armed insurrection to overthrow the United States. And they say that it was an armed insurrection to overthrow the United States government, which is completely insane. But... You know, as long as the paychecks come in, Scarborough doesn't care. And then there's this. Researchers at the Indian Institute of Technology of Bombay recommend masks outside when it's breezy. We recommend, they wrote, wearing masks outdoors in breezy conditions when a person infected with COVID coughs outdoors. Wind flowing in the same direction can spread faster than in calm conditions. Small breeze of five miles an hour in the same direction by someone's coughing increases how far the virus spreads by 20%. Um, I say no. How about that? No masking outside. If you don't wear a mask outside and you get sick or someone else gets sick, too bad. We try to live in the real world here. Nothing is perfect, all right? As ever, tonight's Hold the Line, the No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is up next. Shields high.